Thank you. Um, I'm going to um, try to make this talk very conceptual. So I'm not going to go through some of the key numerical analysis here. I'm going to really try to uh, incorporate ideas about how fluid mechanics things that we know, for example, the creation of low frequency structures like layers, I'm not going to specifically talk about density layers, but I'm very concerned in this numerical work about these low frequency structures. So I'm going to try to do that um, as we go along and concentrate less on the mathematics, I guess, or the analysis. So uh, I just to kick us off, I have one of my favorite uh, graphs of, this is an ocean model. It's an idealized ocean model. It's, but the ocean model that made this picture was used for many years as the ocean component of the um, National Science Foundation's community climate model. So this is the POP model. So it's a, a real ocean model that's used for um, actual climate predictions. And it is really high resolution. And it's, it's, um, it's like a periodic on both sides. So it's a very idealized configuration of the model. Periodic on both sides, a boundary at the top, um, ostensibly of the Antarctic circumpolar current, which is the only ocean that goes all the way around the planet unbroken, right? So this is the sort of model we would like to test numerical models in. And this is what, when I, I, so I was at Los Alamos National Lab for almost 20 years doing sort of applied math support for the ocean model. And this is the sort of configuration we would like to use. You're looking right here at, I think it's um, contours of the temperature. Um, I can't actually remember anymore, but I have another slide coming up. Uh-oh. Hello, computer. Oh, well, this book. I knew that there would be some way for me to break this. I knew that it was too simple. There. Okay. Here, here is, uh, okay, so it's colored by the surface temperature. So um, what I want to show you is this is the type of resolution that's used in climate models even today. This is an old picture, but it's still true that this is about the type of resolution that you get in a climate model. But this is the type of resolution called high resolution, so 0.1 degree. And you can see there's all this detail in the kinetic energy. And then if you look at the potential, potential temperature, and the temperature of the ocean is really important to get right, not just the temperature, but the thermodynamic properties. So this is showing a vertical slice of the temperature. And what you can see in this, for this low resolution run, the cold water blue, it penetrate, penetrates pretty deeply. So less kinetic energy, but it has this deeper cold water. But here in the higher resolution model, uh, the, it, it's much shallower. So, and this is represented in this plot of the depth of the six degree isotherm so you can see what happens at low resolution, this six degree cold water, you know, it goes straight into the ground. In high resolution, it's confined to the, the top. And I, I have some graphs with the kinetic energy in each case. And the eddy kinetic energy, as you increase uh, the code and resolution. And um, I guess one of the key take, whoops, takeaways from this is that this isn't just, it isn't just that we want to see the little eddies, is that this is the model that can reproduce the leading order dynamics of the ocean, which is this conversion of potential to kinetic energy from the, there's a pole to temperature gradient from the sun, and that baroclinic instability occurs and it converts that potential energy to kinetic. And the models we use today cannot do that without help. So one of the most important gains in ocean modeling was understanding how there was this 
model called the Jet McWilliams model, where they were they figured out how to get the potential temperature structure correctly, but they could get no they couldn't get they couldn't get uh, any extra kinetic energy that way. But still, it made the low resolution simulations of the ocean, uh, well, you know, believable could match data, all kinds of all kinds of good things like that. But still today, yes. No, there's a there's a ridge here. You may be one of the few people who knows ocean modeling here. Maybe Bruce does too. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's there's a there's a ridge here that's causing it. Right. So uh, in fact, this is one of the last pictures of the ocean I'm going to show during this talk. But I'm trying. To, what I'm trying to motivate is that even now, even with the huge computers we have. This is still a leading order effect that uh, we still need to use mathematical models for to tune. Okay, so this this is the last picture of the ocean I'm going to show. This is, uh, well, it was one of the most interesting uh, pieces of inf information that I had found from this paper by Fu in 1982. It's the power spectrum of the ocean as measured in the just above the mid-Atlantic ridge. And I always thought this was very cool because you could see peaks where the inertial waves were. This is one of the tides, the M2 tide, which I know very little about, but you could you can see these oscillations here in the power spectra. But the very coolest thing about this is this range of its high power and low frequency here. So when we time step a numerical model, we have to time step down here, but all of the, a lot of the really interesting stuff is happening up here. So this is, this is, um, a, this is a big problem for understand, you know, doing science with the ocean model. And I, I know I've heard talks by other people in this room talking about magnetic fields and so on and how tough it is to get the parameter regimes right. So. Um, I guess what I'm saying here and why I'm spending all this time is that there's a good reason to want to do something new with computing, especially because we have all these new, not all, we have a few exascale computers in the world now. And could we, could we, could we have better models? So that sort of got me interested in looking at some of these new methods. Um, I also want to say I had an experience with training on these new computers with what I would call asynchronous algorithms, where you don't you 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 don't wait for one time step to finish before you go on. And I I was in this room with other people like me who were doing simulation models, but there were also people who were doing um, I would call it image processing and things like this at these big DOE national labs. And there came the day, so we were learning how to program GPUs and things like this. There came the day when we got to the last Friday and we were doing matrix vector multiplies asynchronously and not a single person who did time evolution problems could understand how to do this matrix vector multiply asynchronously. But the people who did image processing had no trouble at all with this. And I, it was an important conceptual moment for me when I understood that somehow by working on these models, I was viewing the climate as sort of like by time slices, by time slices. So we, we just have like three time slices and the old ones go away and the new ones come forward and you're in this tiny little band. So if you're trying to think of time averages or anything like that, it's it's very difficult. So the, the scientists who were doing image processing had a much easier conceptual understanding of the frequency, the frequency content of their stuff. So this, this also got me interested in here uh, in this topic that I'm about to go over. So anyway, these are my main collaborators. They work with Terry Hout. He is a numerical analyst at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and I'm visiting him too while I'm in California. 
Juliana Rosemeyer is a Walter ben Benjamin Fellow who has been working with us on these. Tim Andrews is a PhD student at Exeter, Colin Cotter at Imperial, and Hiroa Yamazaki, who is a postdoc at Imperial. Uh, almost all that I'm going to show is, is about that. So I'm going to talk about the important role of phase averaging when you have really oscillatory PDEs, including when I say phase averaging, what I mean is I'm trying to find the low frequency. I'm trying to make estimates, get an accurate estimate of the low time frequency. So I'm not in, in normal numerical methods. You know that if you like increase the number of grid points, your time step has to go down. You can use implicit methods to take a bigger time step, but if you, if you want accuracy, you still have to obey these time step restrictions. So I'm going to I'm going to briefly talk about where where the point of view that I'm going to use for phase averaging. Briefly introduce time parallelism, and then I'm going to just sketch how we're using the using some of this math, which I think comes from uh, applied analysis of fluid dynamics problems, and give three examples to try to help you understand the physics. I don't fully understand the physics of what we're doing either. Um, and then discuss a few research directions. Okay, so um, I'm gonna consider all the equations that you might want to look at. This, so th these are the Buzanesk equations that we use in the ocean, but now we're just in periodic boxes and doing things in Hilbert spaces. But the equations are the same ones that we used, like for the ocean model that I showed you. So there's two linear terms here, and these linear terms um, have purely oscillatory frequencies. The All of the dissipation, so negative real, is encapsulated in this D, and then there's a nonlinear term. And where is the pressure? I have solved for the pressure and substituted it back in. So if you look at the definitions of the linear operators here, and I don't think you need to look at these in detail. The main thing is that these two operators have oscillator oscillatory frequencies associated with them. One is associated with rotation and the other density stratification. Okay, so that's where to start. And the subject is the subject we're going to look at is the theory of fast singular limits. And I've given a list of people up here who have worked on this, especially in the 1990s, there was a big movement in this area. But uh, oh, this is a really rich subject that goes back through um, Bogolyubov and Mitropolsky and Kiev in World War II and goes back further to the three-body problem from Poincaré. So it's got a very rich history of people trying to look at what's happening with oscillations and then low frequencies. All right. Yep. Yep. That is correct. So you're not you're not doing the primitive standard low rotation. I am using solid body rotation. So just think of triply periodic boxes from here on out. And, and I'm not even going to be able to get to a triple E periodic box by the time we get to the end. So um, this is what I would like to do next, but I think it's a few years off. Okay, these equations that I showed you have these oscillatory frequencies, and then it also has these zero frequency modes. When I talk about something being slow from here on out, I mean these zero frequencies. Sometimes I mean when three of these will add up to zero, but that is what I mean by slow. It turns out that that is not a good enough definition to make these time parallel methods work, but that's what the definition is coming from fast singular limits. So all the equations, now I've, capt I've taken you from the Buzanesque equations, and now here's just the abstraction. So there's a linear operator with a one over epsilon in front of it, only oscillations here. So 
this form of the equations in fluid mechanics, sometimes we think of it as weakly nonlinear, but I tell you, this guy has no effect on the amplitude at all. This, it, we're gonna do a mapping in a second, and you'll see that this is really responsible for um, causing, well, it's a, it's a phase, it's a phase, thing that we're, we're going to see here. This, this is one of the things, the main thing that's going to be causing, you know, viscosity and things like that. So the, the outcome of this one over epsilon in front of L is that it results in these time oscillations, waves, on a scale of order epsilon. So the smaller epsilon is, the faster the waves go. And like I said a minute ago, standard numerical time stepping requires time steps that are small. These equations also give rise to low frequencies created from triadic resonances of linear waves. And this is what we're going to use to try to take larger time steps, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. Yes. Yes. Non-local. Mathematically, it means I put I've solved for the pressure and put it back in, so I have like elliptic operators in the in the math. All right. Um, so this is a standard multi-scale decomposition. I want to go quickly through this. There's just a slow and a fast time scale, and you break the problem into slow and uh, a leading order parts and you substitute these into the equations, and then you use, you find the secular terms to see, and you make the, sure that they're small, and then you can find reduced equations. So this, this fast singular limits um, were, have been very successful doing this in very simple geometries. So the solution to a problem like this, using fast singular limits, is to use this operator. If you've never seen an exponential operator before, you can just think of this as a mapping. It maps whatever you have into the, into the space of the linear waves. There's no approximation of anything being linear here. You know, you've heard of the Lagrangian framework where you map yourself into the frame of the waves. Well, now you're mapping yourself into the oscillations. So the actual waves. So your point of view in the equation is your, the equation is solving for what I call, and some other people call, a modulation equation. So here is, so you have a mapping here. So your U is this linear operator that's modulating something that evolves more slowly. And that slow equation looks like this doesn't seem any different so far, but what happens is you get both the dissipation and the nonlinearity have a time average in it. And oh, this is just the wrong slide, but you should, right here, should be that u is a function of t. So these, these operators here are a function of s. This is where the phase average comes in, because you're gonna be averaging over combinations of these, but these are functions of t, so they're not in the average. Um, and then the outcome of this, you know, I'm not going to read this. I'm just going to show you what this kind of looks like and what the nonlinear term looks like in Fourier space. You have a coupling coefficient here. You have many modes. You can't solve for this on a computer. There's so many, there's so many sums here to do. Um, you have inter, so this is the interaction coefficient. This is like, uh, it's, the, it's the unknown, but it's um, for like, which mode is it? This, this here. And then here you can see that you have these three wave resonances. So when this guy adds up to something small, it doesn't have to be zero. In the method of fast singular limits, it has to be zero. And it takes out all the rest of the waves. But it's been shown over and over again, particularly by Leslie Smith, but other people too, that though you can find these reduced equations uh, for these zero frequencies, if you take these out, your, your numerics will not evolve to the right state. So it tells you where you're going, 
but it doesn't get you there. Okay. All right. Brief introduc introduction to time parallel methods. There is now a book by Martin Gander, who is a hero of the subject. I'm just going to try to give you a very quick feel for it by showing you this. Here's a standard fourth order Runga Kutta method. And even if you don't know anything about numerics, what you can see, what you, I hope you can see is these blue ticks is one time step. And then there's four stages every time step. So the time step is constructed in four stages. And what this particular time parallel method does is it, if, you, if you look, let's say this is the first time step, you don't wait to finish the first time step before you take the second one. You take the first stage, you use that as an estimate for the next stage, you start the next time step. And then you do a deferred correction to get the right answer. And in this way, what would have taken this type of wall clock time here, if you do it time in a time parallel way, you can really get the wall clock time down by almost a factor of four, depending. The penalty is you have to take a smaller time step than you would otherwise. So there's a lot of activity trying to design schemes of this kind that have the largest domain of stability, and then, and then you reduce things to all these parallel steps. So how do you reduce the wall clock time that way? I mean, there are papers that have 25 stage Runga cutter methods. This is a very mature subject by now. Okay, so then here's this other one. And this is the one I'm gonna talk about the most. And uh, how, how this works is you have a coarse propagator and a, or you have a coarse estimate, a, a really large time step, maybe even large grid, and you sweep out these points, uh, this, these pink dots, say, in time. And then, all at the same time, you start here, so you start at every pink dot, and you take tiny time steps all at the same time. So you're taking all the tiny time steps all at once. So therefore, you're, you're satisfying your time step limitation, but you're, um, you're doing it all at once. So you get real wall clock time speed ups if the method converges. If your coarse propagator is cheap, and if the method, this parallel method, converges quickly, then you can get huge parallel speed ups. So just to complete the thought here, this blue line is say what really happens with a fine time step. And then you do a correction at the big spots and you do it again. So if it only takes a few iterations to do this, then it, it is a really fast method. Now, it's known, there's tons of numerical analysis on this now, it knows, it's known that if the method converges, it converges to the method with the error at the finest time scale. So let's say you have a fourth order Runga Kutta method as your finest time scale, then if the method converges, that is the solution you get. So all this is, is trying to accelerate the path to the solution. It is, it is trying to get you there faster. And this is where the idea of low frequencies comes into the problem um, or, or what we're trying to do. So. I want to point you to a Newton Institute lecture, Time Parallel Algorithms for Weather and Climate, 2012. I was in the audience at the time. I said to myself, I am never going to do this crazy thing. This is really, this is really crazy. And now here I am talking to you about it. And this is one of the canonical papers and, and it has an example of the Lorenzo tractor in it. So it's a very friendly paper for people who are concerned about the arrow of time. Um, and let's see, I'll show you this little movie, which I find more intuitive than the algorithm. Like, that was the, the course sweep. And now you see fine time steps coming out. I'm just going to update here really in a second. Update. And then the next time step sweeps out. So this is for a 
the heat equation, which it turns out can be trivially paralyzed in time. But you know, we don't want to do the heat equation, or I don't want to do the heat equation. So the goal of this parallel method is that no matter what epsilon is, you want your time step to be of the same order. So with some of the best, so this is a direct computation using strang splitting. Don't worry if you don't know what that is. It's a, I would call it one an accurate integrating factor type method. And then if we use this strang splitting with parareal, we still have this dependence on epsilon. So when epsilon is small, we are creeping along at a very small time step and we're not getting anywhere. So by using some of what we've learned from fast singular limits, we've been able to concoct algorithms where the time, this course time step is order one. Uh, and for some of our experiments, and very simple experiments, very simple, like the 1D shallow water equations with like a component of rotation sort of going into the board, really simple, really simple oscillatory things. But we can get parallel speed ups of, you know, over 100 on those cases. So um, I wouldn't have thought that was even possible. All right. Um, so this is this is what the equations of motion look like with a coordinate transform transformation. Here is the the operator that's taking you into the frame of the, the oscillating waves, and here is the asymptotic solution. Which oh here I've got the t here. So what we do is we don't integrate over all time, these terms, we integrate over the large time step. So we take, this can be understood intuitively. I'm going to skip all of this and show you this can intuitively be studied this way or understood this way. There's an averaging window that doesn't go to infinity, like fast singular limits. But we, we can study how the solution changes. So you can think of it, you know, you average, you can take a big time step when you average, and then, but you make a big error. And then there's the error from the time stepping here. And there's going to be a place where the error you're making from the time stepping and the error you're making from the averaging uh, balance each other out and you have a minimum here. So this is the intuition for how the error estimate for the low frequency propagator that we're using works. And I'm going to skip this, but I'm going to, I'm going to tell you that we have recently changed this to be a multi-level parareal method. So there's a really coarse level, and I'm, this coarse is parareal jargon. What it means is low frequency. So in my view, this is where we would be seeing layers in a Boussinesque fluid. Something that really lasts a long time, we would see up here. Um, then there can be other levels going down to level zero. <clears throat> and I'd also like you to think of the equations that I showed you at the beginning, where there were two frequencies. There was a buoyancy frequency and a rotation frequency. If one of those is much faster than the other, then it's a natural breaking up of this problem into um, maybe the rotation frequency isn't as fast. So you're averaging over the rotation frequency here. And then each one of these intervals goes into a finer integral to, or interval to average over the buoyancy. All right. I'm going to skip all that. I'm going to show you this multi-level method, how it works for 1D shallow water. And actually, I'm going to show you pictures of 1D shallow water in first. So here it is, here's 0 to 2 pi along this axis. And this is time along the bottom. And it's just a Gaussian dam break problem. But it's still very hard to do this with big time steps. So you let the Gaussian relax and, you know, it goes out and makes things and then it comes back and forms another peak 
And it goes out and comes back. And it goes out and comes back. So this is a standard small time step fourth order Runge-Kutta scheme. And this you're looking at is the height field. So shallow water has two components of velocity and then a sea surface height. So you're, you can see it making peaks and waves. These two figures should be thought of as going together. And the top one is the average over these resonances. So this is the domain from the point of view, you're in the, you're in the plane of the waves. This is the real dynamics of the system in some ways, because it is, it is um, this is where we take a factor of 50 bigger time step than we can with any other method. But to get back to this picture, all you have to do is take this solution and rotate it back using this exponential operator. So I just wanted to give you an intuition about what is what could, what does it look like when we're looking at these low frequency solutions? So, so you have that slide one minute. Trying to get it just going to be yep. so that I can imagine the wave frequency step by the wavelength in the Yes. I'm I'm thinking of I'm thinking of the slow dynamics here as being something that evolves very slowly in time. Yeah, I think of it as the in this context where we've done this finite averaging and we only know a little bit about this math, but you can think of it as we're integrating the modulation equation. So this is this is the modulation equation, or if, you know, if you think to if you think back to the um, oh I can't think of his name, but you know the first people who were using the eigenfunctions of the linear operators to understand triadic resonances and things like that, this is that equation that's been averaged over the frequencies on a certain time scale. So this this is actually what those equations look like, you know, when, when people are writing papers and they're talking about the resonances, that's what they look like. Which, what shallow? Yes, they are. Yes, yes, yes. It, yes, there's, there's hyperviscosity. It, it does have some slow dynamics, and that is in here too. But what I want you to see is that there's, there's no, nothing like the activity that you see here. This is the thing, all, all this is, is this rotated back. This is the modulation happening, the waves modulating something slower, is, which is what the theory of fast singular limits says is happening, right? It isn't because we're taking finite averages, we're breaking all kinds of rules. So we do the integrals like with smooth kernels and stuff like that. So the theory is still, still sort of being worked out. But it's, this, is, this is where I want to do my time stepping in the model. And then I, I don't know what I think about perireal. Um, well, I'll say some more about that later. But I also wanted to show you Lots of people have tried to use, say, the quasi-geostrophic limit, to take, which, which is a perfectly good low-frequency solution to these equations. Well, the perireal method will not converge then. And this is what, in fact, it looks like as it evolves in time uh, versus an optimally averaged case. Um, so one of the reasons for this I think, but I am not sure, is that the averaging we do includes the near resonances. This is what Leslie Smith and other people have repeatedly shown is absolutely required to direct the energy toward, I, I don't wanna call it a slow manifold, it's a fast manifold, but it's directing it there. So 
we managed to incorporate those nearly zero frequencies. Um, and then I'll go back to here and show you this is this is these the one this is the equations I just showed you. And there's um, these diamonds are the initial guess from the low frequency solution. The actual solution is this black line. You can see that the error in the amplitude is egregious. It's egregious. The first iterate is this darker line, and we get the amplitudes that so through that. So the parareal works very well with amplitude, but not phase. You have to find another way to do the phase. And then I, the second iterate is here too, but you can see we get pretty close just on the first iterate. So making a guess with the right phase. So we nail the phase with this method. And then we do the first, the parareal iteration to get the amplitude correctly. Yes, I wish I knew. I'm going to skip this one. I wish I knew. There is, I, I feel like the Foyer series, which is helping us understand what's happening with the wave resonances, is also our worst enemy because it makes us try to understand everything in terms of linear superposition. So when we look at, say, the frequencies versus wave number, we get into a huge tangle of many degrees of freedom, and we can't really see what the shape of that is. If we could understand what the shape of that is, then we might be able to do something with, say, looking at rates of change of that and finding minimums and things like that. So we're trying to use like the method of characteristics instead of the exponential operator to see if we can get some intuition with that. But the question, the answer is, I don't know. We tinker with it and we see what is optimal. It's definitely not ready for the ocean model <laughs> or the periodic box. <laughs> but I did want to show you, this is um, the relaxation of buoyancy oscillations in 2D Buzanes. So just a slice. And it just hit it with some initial condition and let it relax. So there's this. Um, I'm not going to be able to just discuss this in detail, but I just wanted to show you something about what the averaging looks like in this map space versus taking an average. And when I'm saying take an average here, I'm talking about what is a mean flow? What is a mean flow for you, if, 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 if you wanna think about it? Um, the, the mathematicians, you know, I'm thinking to one of the classic books on the subject, Sanders, Murdoch, no, Sanders, Verholst, and Murdoch talk about this and they say, shame on you if you're averaging your differential equation without doing this mapping, because you're, you are going to get the wrong answer. So I just wanted to show you in this paper here, Juliana Rosemeyer and I just took a very simple case to see what the mapping and averaging was doing. So this here is this uh, black line, which you can't see it's so close to the red line, and it's oscillating. This is the, act, this is the buoyancy, and this is time. And I, this, or no, this is, sorry, this one is the, the actual one. This is in the map domain. And uh, this has two different averages. The red line is a smaller time average or phase average than the blue line here. Um, but it's, it's going along okay here, this averaging, making errors in the amplitude like we expect it will do. But as the solution starts to relax, it's becoming even more oscillatory as, as it's decaying. But you can see here that the averaging, if you look at the highest averaging, which is a window, time window of 0.2, it follows through the middle of the higher oscillations here. So we're really trying to understand what happens to the time rate of change. So when the time rate of change of the buoyancy becomes small, that is what I want to use. Uh, 
I'm going to show you that in a minute. Over here in the physical domain, where we've unwound the mappings, you can see that the time average or this, this averaging does not, it does not follow the true solution at all. So mathematically, doing your phase averaging, I'm not talking about any space averaging here. This is all time averaging in the math domain. Um, leads to different results. So I'm trying to quantify what those look like in that paper. So that one of the last things I'm going to show is the time rate from these simulations, the time rate of change of the buoyancy with, and this is um, in the map space with three different averaging windows. So the buoyancy is moving kind of slow. And this, I think this is a Brunt Faisal frequency of like 20 or something like that. Uh, it's going slow and then it starts oscillating. Um, our, our window of 0.2 is the one to keep an eye on here. I mean, you can look at the red one too, but it's so close to the black one, it's hard to see anything interesting here. But this, when the time rate of change is smaller, is where we're gonna have what I think of is where I'm looking for mean flows. And I don't know what's going, I don't know what the answer is going to be. So we're trying to take this case just with a simple 2D Boussinous flow and look at what mean flows look like with forcing now. So this was just very simple. So there's a couple new directions, which is Hiroa uh, and Colin Cotter have used this, not the parareal method, but this only this coarse propagator, this coarse method, time stepping method, without any time parallel. There's other time parallelism in here, which I'm not going to go into, but they're not using this parareal method. And um, so it's actually on the sphere in this in the fire drake. And I just want to show you the error. So you would think by introducing this averaging, we would be getting much higher errors than standard methods. But in fact, it's significantly lower. In, so the dashed line here, I know this is very hard to read. And um, if, if anyone wants to look at these slides closer, that I can be happy to provide them for you. But these straight lines are the standard time step, the error in the standard time stepping method. Now the, and this is averaging window down here. So the larger the time step, the greater the errors we make. And we have not been able to take large time steps in this method, unlike the simpler cases we have used. And we think this is, we don't know why yet, but we, we are using a Chebyshev approximation to our matrix exponential, which there's, there's this paper called uh, 19 dubious ways to compute the matrix exponential. And it was published a long time ago. And then 20 years later, they updated it. And it's called 19 dubious ways to compute the matrix exponential. So there are new and exciting time parallel ways to compute this, but it is a tricky business. So um, we don't know that, you know, there's a paper about this, but how this would take a bigger time step is still unknown. Um, uh, this is this is the work of Tim Anders. So this is the transformation or the mapping that I was showing you about. And then you put it into a standard form and you get something like this. This is Tim's slide. And you can see this is the modulated space. This is also for a 1D shallow water equation. And you can see how many oscillations are in the real solution down here. So this is where we want to time step. Um, instead of just using the matrix exponential, you can, you can add an extra term. So instead of having u equals e to the minus ltv, we have a new variable w. And then we put in a mean correction. This mean correction would be a low frequency thing. So in the mapping, you would take out the you would take out the layers too. 
you would take out the really slowly evolving low frequency stuff in your actual mapping. So Tim has some very interesting results about this. So for the elastic pendulum, which is one of our favorite problems to do this with, the elastic pendulum, how am I doing on time? I'm still okay. The elastic pendulum, a spring and a weight, and you pull it down and it oscillates and then it nonlinear effects cause it to start swinging and then start springing and swinging and uh, there's an even slower frequency. So we like to think of these swinging modes as like Rosby waves and the springing modes as like inertia gravity waves or something. And the way they go back and forth, uh, we love that, but the slowest frequency of the problem is the precession. And that is when, when the pendulum itself, if it's not confined to a 2D plane, it just switches every, it goes from fast, it goes from springing to swinging, then chink, then chink, then chink, you know, like that, right? So um, Tim, using this idea, there's no layers here, this is just a system of ODEs, but he was able to get the frequency phase very accurately but only for when epsilon is very small. So in like the ocean, like the Arctic Ocean, the stratification is weak, that this wouldn't help you there so far. Anyway, these, these are these plots of window size uh, versus error. They're a little bit like what I showed you, how the method works of averaging and time stepping. But you can see that this alternate or mean correction method, which is red, is getting the error pretty well lower here. And, and over here, which is, these are both for the swinging spring. Um, this one is not in resonance, direct resonance. This one is directly resonating where we expect there to be precession. Uh, you can see that it there's an interesting oscillation happening in the air, which we don't understand either. All right, so I'm going to wrap things up here. So I introduced you to basic time parallelism. I wanted to say about this too, this parareal method. I've seen, I've seen many people put their giant model into it and try to make it go. But I hope that you don't ever do this without... Um, for oscillatory things, uh, oscillatory problems. I hope I've shown you enough that you don't do that. It's, this parareal method is an amplitude thing and almost everybody just takes it and runs it and it takes almost as many iterations to converge the model as it would have to have taken small time steps. It's not really suitable for things with oscillations. In fact, uh, when I was a kid, there was on TV, this guy who would get on a motorcycle and in, in, in a stadium, his name was Evil Knievel, and he, would, and he would jump his motorcycle over all these cars to the other side. And on TV, it would say, don't do this at home. So I'm telling you, don't do this at home. There, there's, if you, if, there's now so many papers, and in the book by Martin Gander, it will explain why you should be cautious with oscillations with this method. There are plenty of interesting time parallel methods for oscillatory problems, but don't do that one. Or multi-grid in time. Unless you're prepared to map yourself into characteristic coordinates or something like that, don't do it. So I'm not an advocate. I'm very curious, when does this work? And how does this work with cases in fluid dynamics where we have low frequencies, and I can't help thinking of my experience with the learning to program asynchronously with the image processing people who had no problem understanding things that were low frequency. And all of us, there, was, there were a few plasma physicists there. We were completely stuck. We, we couldn't even get the concept, right? So that, this is where I'm, where I'm coming from. 
So we had a, this 2014 paper uh, was the first one Terry and I did together. He was a postdoc at Los Alamos where we showed that the time step can be taken independent of epsilon using modifications of fast singular limits. Um, then a 2019 paper with Adam Peddle, who was a PhD student who worked with both of us, he found this, found that I should that I explained to you about the time stepping and the averaging. So he did that. And now there's this paper that's a multi-level paper. And I am finally getting back to trying to understand what this looks like in fluid mechanics, doing some fluid mechanics papers that study what mean flows are in this way, like averages of resonances and things like that. But we only have the paper that I showed you with the simple decaying 2D slice right now. So we're gonna continue with this mean correction work and explore what's happening on the sphere here. Um, but that's all I have for you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yes. Well, that's the type of operator we used in the ocean model. Yeah, but should it be? And are the oscillations really nonlinear? Past oscillations? Um, I think that they are. Uh, but I wouldn't show up. So, so uh, mathematically, what's happening here? It's not. It's not a physics problem. Mathematically, the e to the lt has a particular behavior where you can show if you do the mapping, the linear operator cancels out, right? Should I go back to that? No, no, right, right. So the, this is a property of exponentials. So you're mapping into the plane of the waves. Yeah, but I'm saying, what are the waves not? So the waves are nonlinear by the time you get to the modulation equation, and that's where you see the three wave resonances, okay? But here, here's what, here's, Here's what I think, I, and I said this earlier, the Fourier, the Fourier method, though it lets us look very deeply into the equation, you are right about, so there's an inherent superposition issue going on here. So looking at the nonlinear term and the relationship of the two, is by no means, I feel, uh, understood. Yeah. Well, it, it, it does contain an epsilon in the E to the L T's. There's a, it right here, I have to go all the way back. I have to go all the way back here. Really? Here. Do you see, here's the epsilon, right here. Here's the epsilon. So the fast, the smaller this epsilon is, the, the more the nonlinearity is doing, it's, it's like a phase scrambler. And the way it makes low frequencies is sort of different and the same. And this is, there's no assumptions of something being linear here. It is just that you've taken the linear term that you have that has the oscillations and you've done a mapping. So there's no approximations of being linear or linearizing or weakly nonlinear or anything. So funny you should say that. There's, I found an entire cottage industry of people doing WIDM averaging, which is very closely related to this, uh, with shocks, they call it dispersive shocks. I wish I understood what they were doing, but they've developed an entirely new language themselves too. So yes, there are people who study what are happening, what happens to oscillations with shocks.
Yes, yes, it could. Yep. That very well could be. That is a very interesting idea. No, no. I'm struck no. by the similarity of Right, I don't know that one, but which is designed basically to <laughs> Right. 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 So um I wrote a paper, but in, in company with um, Emin and Maida and and Babin and Mahalov and those guys, uh, where you where you uh, do the projection. In fact, Joanne and Laura Curry and I, Joanne Mason and Laura Curry and I are trying to look at that for a simple magnetic field right now, um, where you can project your your data from like a turbulent solution onto the null space of the fast operator. And then you can see what's happening with the stuff that is not on the null space. So all that will be adding up to being the near resonances. The, I, or I'm guessing, I don't know how we can tell. <laughs> but. It could be, it could be, it could be. Yeah, that is a very interesting idea. Well, it's because they're only the direct resonances, and uh, a lot is no. Oh, and the wave turbulence community uses the same machinery as me, and they are concerned with how does energy head toward quasi geostrophy? How does it work? Right. So, I keep thinking of uh, Leslie Smith's papers where she. So one of the things she does is she she, she takes rotating Navier Stokes, no buoyancy. And she shows how you turn on rotation and it forms columns, which is the low frequency part. And then uh, what she does, she does it again, leaving all the direct resonances in and taking out artificially all of the near resonances and the columns never form. So the, the, it is really thought that these waves that aren't quite zero are doing the bulk of the energy transformation toward the zero frequencies. These are true for any epsilon in my book, but lots of people only want to do it for small ones. But uh, the whole reason we take a finite average for this numerics is because it's useless to do a small epsilon thing when you've got an ocean that has, you know, order one stratification in the Arctic and strong stratification in other places, right? So that method has to work no matter what. So that, that plot that I showed you with that has averaging windows and time steps, that is not requiring any epsilon to be small. It may not buy you anything. If epsilon is order one, you know, you can just time step at order one at your leisure, right? Yes, yes. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's a comparison of QG and an optimal, uh, an optimal uh, average here, right here. This is QG, evolving QG. Now, I want to tell you, this is for this weird 1B shallow water equations. What it would work, what it would look like, I'm not sure. Or the regular thing, but these these guys who do the heterogeneous multi-scale method, they have tried repeatedly to use equations from fast singular limits, which QG is. QG is not a slow manifold. It is it is a, a fast manifold. And um, anyway, here it's evolving and decay because there's decay in it. Evolving and decay. This. Uh, causes the pararial method to diverge. So it cannot, it cannot bring itself to make a structure like this. 
in the parareal method. You know what? I haven't done a very close comparison of these two things, but that would also be interesting to do. You've taken them out, all out, basically, at least for the cases I'm looking at. Right? With Rousby waves, that, uh, that would be different. I would love to do that problem. Yeah, yeah, it modulates it. It it it, it is. I, I've done triply periodic solutions or uh, simulations. You know, five hundred, a thousand cube. Whoops. With uh, actually, I showed those to you in two thousand and twelve when I visited Leeds, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, this. It is the fast waves modulating the slow thing. And the fast theory of fast singular limits tells you that this thing is quasi geostrophy and that this thing here is modulating it. The waves modulate the slow dynamics. So this hasn't been successful for numerical methods because of this limit. And this is what you've got to use in order to uh, find a slow solution. So it's a it's an apply it's a um, it's an analysis problem. So the analyst that I'm working with from Surrey, uh, Bin Cheng, he and Zesis, I can't think of Zesis's last name, but they've been writing papers about fast singular limit analysis with finite, you know, not zero frequencies. And I think, John, you might know this work better than me, but Babin, Mahalov, and Nikolenko also did one case that had all these near resonances in it. And they wound up doing a lot of, I would call it um, stuff with like pure mass stuff with integers, with the, with the, those many sums. Um, that was like in 1997 or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> the nonlinear, yes. Oh, yes. That's that. I'm sorry if I made you think it was the amplitude here. The nonlinear phase is absolutely crucial. When your linear operator, has only oscillations in it, then its main job is to be cause the nonlinear term to be a phase scrambler. So it's all about the phase. That's why <laughs> we're able to make egregious errors in the amplitude. But when we nail the phase right, it's almost like you have, if you're doing numerics, you're trying to find like the time rate of change. So you've got the Taylor series expansion. So if you can get the direction of those time steps to be going in the right direction, then you're, you're in, a, in good shape. So immediately, the parareal method, when it's doing the fine step thing, as long as it knows which way to go, then it, <laughs> it's get, it computes the amplitude if you tell it the right direction. Bruce? <laughs> Right. So, part of when you set epsilon, you're really stepping uh, up and down with the frequency. Yes. So, in some sense, I think what you're doing is yep. questioning it. So okay. So, <laughs> most of the methods can filter of different classes of prior methods ability to pull up and
I would say, I, I would say, I am not looking at this as an instability at all. I'm saying this type of machinery here tells you where is it going. It does not tell you how it gets there. So when you're talking about instability theory, you're starting from somewhere and you're sort of watching where it goes by finding eigenmodes and things like that. But this is about where it, where it's going to go in the end. I really feel like this is much more about like geostrophic adjustment than it is, than it is um, how I understand that kind of instability theory. I mean, I Does that? Okay. When you get to the ocean, like, there's upscale and downscale. Yes. One type. I don't think so. I, I described the instability as a capacity to see things in instability, which is progressively just smaller and smaller. So I think what I'm doing is I am keeping all the waves that add up to something small, small, decided by the time step I want to take. I will tell you, I didn't mention this, but there's a very cool time step limit in the, in the average time step equation. That's a nonlinear time step problem. And I, I don't know how to find, I don't know how to find that limit right now. Uh, but I think, I think, so I've got all of the waves and, you know, when we're doing stuff like this, Sometimes we're using the Fourier method, but sometimes we're not. We're constructing, like Collins work, we're constructing the problem with finite elements. So we don't have any Fourier modes in here. We time average the operators as we construct them with the finite elements, right? So there's no cutoff frequency. It's an actual time average of an operator, right? So all of the frequencies that would have added up to bit to some value are included in it. And it doesn't matter which ones are growing fast or slow. If they add up to something small, they're included. One of the things that I thought would be super cool uh, related to this was to use um, more of the machinery for studying precession, which is where you expand the coefficients in terms of an amplitude that is only positive and, and an e to the i phi by itself. So that you could, you know, that's the way you find a precession frequency relative to the triadic frequencies because that might change things here too. But I, I don't feel like I'm filtering out all frequencies below a certain, I'm not filtering out all linear frequencies below a certain threshold. I am filtering only the nonlinear term not anything to do with the linear waves. Yes. Yep, yep. 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 Yes. So the answer is I don't know. I, I do know. So there have been people who have applied parareal and time parallel methods to really like, well, to tokamax with super turbulent data and gotten very fast speed ups. But I don't understand how this happened. I'm happy to point you to these papers that was in combination with a scientist from UK AEA, whose name I'm sorry, I can't remember, but along with uh, researchers from Oak Ridge National Lab, right? So how they decided the statistics were right is a mystery to me, but they were they were definitely looking at stuff like that. And um, if your if your fine scale numerical method gives you wrong statistics, nothing can help you. But the I feel like uh, a lot is really understood about how 
hair reel converges to the exact solution mathematically. Um, one of the reasons, so, so Greg Eink wrote a paper about the rota fast rotation limit because he didn't think that the fast singular limits would help out at all with turbulence. But he found that that wasn't correct. So that's, that's Chen Chen Eink at all. I can't, can't remember what year. I don't, you don't know either. Yeah, anyway, the relation, I think what you're asking me about is the relationship of the fast singular limits to turbulence, I think, is rather than time parallelism. And I, I, can, I can only point you to that paper. I believe there have been more, but that's the paper that I have been focusing on because those are the sorts of problems I've been looking at. But you might, you might, you might, uh, you might start there if you were curious. So I feel like what Greg found was that the dynamic still goes in the direction, including with all of the, the conservation laws. So there's, I didn't talk about this at all, but these reduced equations will have special conservation laws that go with them too. And he showed through du direct numerical simulations that these special conservation laws are also hold up when the flow is turbulent, right? There were things he didn't like about it, but I don't remember what that was often. <laughs> I'm not saying I know it'll work. I'm just saying some people have looked at it. So, yes. I feel like it's all math, but Pat's idea. Yeah. This, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What do you put in? Oh, well, we can we can construct the matrix exponential exactly, even with a pencil. It re, it re, it results down to sines and cosines and time. So okay. it's very easy. What? No, no. You start the the key. One of the key ingredients is how hard you pull down the pendulum. But the the procession, and we're really after procession here. I think I feel uh, is only known to happen in the case when the springing is twice the speed of the swinging. And that's based on the physical parameters of the pendulum. And there's a there is a there is a paper by Daryl Holm and Peter Lynch that find the exact equation for the precession. And I went through that calculation with the fast singular lim machinery, but instead of taking the limit as t to infinity, I did it periodic because that made sense for that problem. And I get exactly their equation for the precession. Mm -hmm. So they, they mapped into the Grangian coordinates and used Hamilton's principle. I never touched those. I mapped into the coordinates of the weights and do it. 